morning, everyone. Welcome to Gospel this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us today. Uh, you may have gotten a uh, worship guide on the way in, um, or perhaps you're at home and you've got the uh, virtual worship guide there. Uh, for those of us who are here today, in that, of course, you'll find a connection card. So if you're a first-time guest or have anything that you'd like to um, maybe let us know, feel free to write down uh, uh, those things on the connection card. Let us know. Uh, fill in as much as you'd like or as little as you would like. But at any rate, we're happy to have you here today. Good to see some faces around that we haven't seen in a while. Um, and great to... Uh, to see those of you who are healthy enough to be with us today, still praying for so many people that um, aren't uh, or at this point are still at home. We're looking forward to a time when we'll all be able to uh, gather again together. So a couple of announcements. We'll get through this very quickly. Um, at a time where gospel is giving locally, today is the last day that if you'd like to give to the Pregnancy Help Center, at least through uh, the body here, we are collecting that. So please, uh, please take a look at that. This is the last day, I guess, to donate for that time. I'm sure you could donate anytime, but today, at least officially for what we're doing as a church, is the last day to donate. So if you want to, uh, again, put that in your own offering or include that, you can place that if you're here today in the black boxes. Or if you, again, are watching online today, you can do that through the church app or even, again, through the worship guide that you see virtually. I uh, also wanted to make a quick announcement about the new gospel gear, Better Together. I really like that. I hope you do, too. So sweatshirts, T-shirts, hoodies, I don't know, whatever. There are, there are all sorts of things that are available. So feel free to look at that online, or I know we've got some advertisements here in the lobby so take a look at that sign up for that uh, be a part of that wear that uh, around our community also a couple cancellations um, upcoming uh, that we will not have this year the ugly uh, adult or I should say the adult ugly sweater <laughs> party has been canceled so if you have an ugly sweater or you find yourself ugly as an adult, you're, we're not going to be doing that. We're also not going to uh, be having uh, officially the Kid City Family Christmas Caroling. So those two events right now uh, are canceled. Uh, the Mission Spotlight today, a couple of those. Uh, Coley Ely uh, is an upcoming missionary to South Hall, England. Uh, she is still stateside, but hoping to be able to finally go uh, to England maybe after the beginning of the year. And I think from a recent um, post that she is fully funded. So we're grateful for that, grateful for God's faithfulness in that. So uh, let's be in prayer for Coley and uh, the future that God has planned for her in England. Um, also, in terms of our church spotlight, we're praying for Christian Missionary Alliance Church, uh, just a neighbor of ours literally now right across the street. Uh, in their pastoral transition. So we're praying that God would encourage them uh, in his word today and they would be uh, rooted deeply within, with, with, within that word and build up in the faith. Uh, very sadly, it was just brought to my attention just moments ago that uh, Michael Hess has passed away. Michael uh, was a part of uh, our church in terms of coming uh many times for several years uh, and also to uh, some of our life groups uh, so I don't have any other details uh, with that other than to say it was a little over a week ago so sad news um, uh, about that so difficult times we find ourselves in uh, but God is faithful he is as we'll read in a moment the God of hope so we thank him for that. So let's pray this morning. Father, we bow to you, Lord, this morning. Thankful, God, for who you are and what you're accomplishing. 
and your people and your church this morning. We're thankful, God, for this place that we uh, have been given by you, Lord, to come and gather together as a people, as a church, Lord, to, God, bring glory to you, to lift up your name, God, to, to lift up your Son, who is the Savior, God, of this world and the Savior, Lord, of those who believe. God, our faith, Lord, today seems more challenged than it has been. Our faith seems to waver, God. We are asking you, Lord, to increase our faith this morning. Lord, we do believe, but God, we're praying that you would help our unbelief. It is so close, God, to, uh, to how we live and where we live and what we see when we look around. Lord, we hear these sad stories of death. We, we hear sad stories of sickness and difficulty. God, we just hear this morning of other churches that are, that are closing their doors for the time, God, and we pray, Lord, for your mercy. We pray, God, for your grace. Lord, we are uh, just asking you, God, to help us Lord, rely more on you. Lord, we're praying for the churches around us, particularly for CMA. God, praying for Sean and his family as they move on and praying for God, whatever you're doing in that congregation, God, we're just praying for them this morning that you would bless them, Lord, with, with a pastor, with a shepherd, uh, God, to, to lead them and guide them. God, we're praying for Coley as she uh, awaits the time where, Lord, you will use her uh, God, um, in England, we're just praying, God, now for the people of South Hall, for the kids of South Hall, God, that she will be, uh, Lord, ministering to. We just uh, ask you, Lord, to continue to pray, uh, to, uh, to uh, prepare their hearts and her heart. God, we're just thanking, Lord, of the many missionaries across, Lord, uh, the world that uh, find themselves in difficult predicaments, yet, God, you um, are not surprised. So, Lord, we lean on you this morning. And in a time, Father, when our souls may feel cast down, God, in a time where it seems, Father, that turmoil abounds and we don't even know at times, Lord, what to ask or even think, we're reminded of what Paul told us through the Ephesians that you, God, are able to do far more, exceeding abundantly more than we can think or ask. So you, Lord, are our hope. And we, God, thank you for that hope and pray, God, that as we come together this morning, that you would bless us as, Lord, we turn to bless you in our worship. Prepare our hearts now for your word, for your spirit. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. If you'll stand with me, if you're here today and able to, we'll read from Psalm 42. Uh, please join me on the uh, underlined portion. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession in the house of God with glad shouts of songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of Him who died for thee. And hail Him as thy matchless King through 
Let's pray together this morning. Lord, you are good to all, and your mercy is over all that you have made. You are faithful in all your words, and you are kind in all your works. You are the one that upholds all who are falling and raise up all who are bowed down. You are the only one who satisfies. You are the one who fulfills the desires of those who fear you. Lord, I pray this morning that you would open up our eyes, that we may see wonderful things from your word. Give us life according to your word. God, we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're so glad that we could be together, and our goal each week is to stay as healthy as we can so that we can continue to meet in worship together, that we can continue discipleship throughout the week, and uh, thankful that this uh, Wednesday, Awana will be back, and uh, our life groups will, after this week, also be on break for the month of December. It's just a rest month, and then we'll pick back up in January, and so uh, praying for our families. Some are still uh, obviously affected by COVID, and uh, 
are quarantining and doing that whole routine, and so praying for them, praying for patience. Uh, we are in a very different season. Uh, my family, for the first time, spent Thanksgiving basically by ourselves. Uh, through FaceTime, we saw our family that was all gathered down in Virginia, Kelly's family down in Cincinnati, but uh, we were with none of them. And so, very different season that we are in. And it's easy for us to, to try to find our hope in those gatherings or f- to find our hope in routine or what we might feel is normal. But who's to say that God doesn't bring about something that's completely different than everything we've ever experienced and that is the new normal? You know, that's something that we think about. God is our hope. He is the one that's consistent. He is the one that is the same, uh, you know, yesterday, today, and, and tomorrow. He is the one that isn't moving and going anywhere. So may God help us to see through his eyes, and may we trust him as he guides us. This season is the season of Advent. We begin today as we uh, look at hope and faith and joy and peace through this season. And we've been in the book of Acts, who the writer is... Uh, Luke the doctor, and so we thought let's take a time and, and really have a mini-series in this Advent season of looking at some of Luke's writings around the ideas of hope and faith and joy and peace from the Gospel of Luke. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. So we're not looking necessarily at the Christmas story or what we would say is the Christmas story. But we're looking at the ideas of hope through Luke's writings and different passages over the next four weeks. And so I hope that you'll be able to join us in person. If not, there is live stream that you could take advantage of. But we hope if we're healthy, let's gather together as the church and let's be together. In Latin, the word Advent means coming. The coming of Jesus. In This season of the year, we we focus on the meaning of the coming of Jesus, the Son of God, into the world. And the spirit of our celebration of, of Christ should be the spirit in which he came. And the spirit of that coming can be summed up in Luke 19, verse 10, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The fact is, is that Jesus' coming was a search and save mission. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Advent really is a season for thinking about the mission of God to seek and to save the lost people from the wrath to come. That God raised from the dead Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, as 1 Thessalonians says. It's a season for cherishing and worshiping this characteristic of God. That he is a searching and saving God. That he is a God on mission. That he is not passive. That he is not indecisive. That God is never in maintenance mode. Coasting or drifting. That God is a God who is sending. That God is a God who is pursuing and searching and saving. That's truly the meaning of Advent. We've been in the book of Acts and we've seen that, that Acts is really a celebration of this Advent heart of God, that God is sending and searching, that God is pursuing, that God is saving, that God is on the move to seek and to save the lost. The book of Acts is really a narration of of Jesus' ongoing Advent into more and more people's lives, into more and more of peoples of the world. Acts really is a, a story of how the early church understood the words in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so am I also sending you. It's a story of how the vertical advent of God in the mission of Jesus bends out and really becomes the, the horizontal advent of Jesus in the mission of the church and also the mission in us. Jesus came into the world at the first advent. And every Advent since really is a reminder of his continual Advent into more and more lives. And his Advent, in fact, our Advent, our coming, our moving also into the lives of those that are around us, into the peoples of the world. Now in the Gospel of Luke, we see God revealed in the person of his Son. We, we have the privilege of getting to know God himself. We find ourselves drawn into his presence of of his love. 
In fact, Luke 19 teaches us that Jesus is the Savior of the lost, that he is the Savior of those he pursues and those who repent and believe. And the story of Zacchaeus is a great reminder and picture of how God pursues, how he pursues the lost, how he pursues you and me. If you remember Zacchaeus, and maybe you were taught about that story in Sunday school, uh, I can remember the song that went along with it from the time that I was just a a little kid, that Zacchaeus was a, a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, that he climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. That song has been in my heart and mind for the past, I don't know, 35 years, thinking about Zacchaeus. And so let's read this uh, together in Luke 19, looking at verses 1 through 10. And so if you'd stand for the reading of the word this morning. In Luke 19, beginning in verse 1, it says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small and small. In stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. May God bless the name of his word. You may be seated this morning. Just a little bit of context. In the prior chapters, Jesus has been traveling. In verse 1, we see that Jesus finally enters Jericho. The city of Jericho, really, in Jesus' visit, it's the last major city that, that he visits before entering Jerusalem. Now, we know that he has prophesied several times that when he reaches Jerusalem, that he will be betrayed, that he'll be tried by sinful men, that he'll be beaten, that he will be mocked and killed and then raised from the grave three days later. And verse 1 reminds us of what is uh, approaching. And we see there in verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4, that, that Zacchaeus puts himself where, where he can see Jesus. It's a great reminder for us because we have an opportunity to put ourselves in the path of hope. To put ourselves in the path of hope. It's in this context that Zacchaeus is is trying to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 2 through 4, it introduces us to who Zacchaeus is and records the effort that, that he went to, to see Jesus. But who was Zacchaeus? His name in Hebrew means pure or or Righteous. But if anyone knew Zacchaeus, or if you knew him in that day, no one would think of those character traits when Zacchaeus' name was mentioned. In fact, Zacchaeus was someone that was disliked. He was someone that was hated because he was a tax collector. Verse 2 says that he was a chief tax collector and that he was rich. And both of those kind of descriptions kind of tell us something about Zacchaeus' spiritual life. As a tax collector, he worked for Rome, and he was considered a traitor by the Jewish people. The fact that he worked for the Roman IRS uh, indicated to others that he was more interested in power. He was more interested in money than, than anyone. And so tax collectors were someone that was hated in Israel because they worked for the Roman government that oppressed the Jewish people. So in the eyes of, of the Jewish people, uh, Zacchaeus was a, a betrayer. He was a betrayer of his own people. In fact, in the minds of the people, tax collectors were often thought of uh, along the, the same lines as a murderer, or a robber, or adulterer, or other sinners. But Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. It says that he was a, a chief tax collector. And in all likelihood, as you think about that, he did not receive that position by working hard. He probably rose to the ranks by, by being more crooked than any other tax collectors who often cheated people out of their earnings. He was someone that probably succeeded in taking people's money, and because of that, they put him over other tax collectors who were taking people's money. 
And it works something like this. If the Roman tax was 10% or the Roman tax was 5%, Zacchaeus would be a guy that would say, okay, guys, charge 10%. And you get a cut in that and I get a cut in that and we'll send the 5% to, to Rome. And so because of that, because of him excelling at being crooked, he, he became this chief tax collector. You also notice that it says there in verse 2 that he was rich. Now, in chapter 18, you remember what the Lord says about rich people. How hard it is for those who, who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. But here, I think Jesus demonstrates that what is impossible with man is really possible with God. Luke 18, verse 27. That Zacchaeus is a sinner. Zacchaeus is, is rich. He's the kind of guy that you wouldn't expect to, to make it into the kingdom. Jesus talks about these kind of people. But we see a, an example of a guy who is pursued by God and who sees Jesus and who is trying to see Jesus. That's what verse 3 says. I think that sentence is really full of meaning. Why was he trying to see Jesus? Why, why was he so curious? I can imagine that Zacchaeus' life was probably wearing on him. At some point, you know, being rich wasn't all as cracked up to be, taking money from people. I'm sure that at times he felt the guilt. I'm sure he felt the shame. I'm sure he felt the conviction of, uh, of the words of Christ to be righteous. I'm sure he begins to feel these things in his own life. And I know that obviously we see from this text that God is pursuing Zacchaeus, and we'll see that a little bit more in just a moment. But his hope and, and really his power and, and his money, all of these things were really just temporary. These things would really come and go with the ebb and flow of, of life. You know, it's, it's really not unusual for the thing in which we place our hope and to, to fail us. That these things horizontally that we look after, that we chase after, that we pursue many times in our life, the things that we're putting our hope in horizontally, they, they fail us. They, they can't be what we really need. They can't fix us. They can't really help us. And so for Zacchaeus, power and, and money wasn't enough. It didn't fill the, the emptiness that, that he had in his life. It seems like, to some degree, in some way, shape, or form, life wasn't fulfilling. A reminder of the words in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 8, 9, and 10, it says, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. In verse 10 it says, Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. That for Zacchaeus, that life was really just unfulfilling, that it wasn't working, that this wasn't really true happiness. He couldn't find it. Money, power wasn't enough. But also I think life, to some degree, probably seemed out of control. In Ecclesiastes 1.15, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I mean, think about his life for just a moment. The only reason anyone would respect him is because he had power and money. But he didn't earn that money. He didn't even earn that respect. He took it from other people. He made other people's lives miserable in the way that he was living his life. I think that kind of life weighs on you. He was crooked and he couldn't straighten himself out and he was trying to see Jesus. Now, I don't think that Jesus and Zacchaeus knew each other. But perhaps the crowd that was traveling with Jesus kind of piqued his interest. Perhaps he maybe even heard something about this new rabbi who did miracles or astounded people with his teaching. Or even how he accepted outcasts. In some way, shape, or form, he sees the crowd. He sees them traveling. His interest is piqued and he goes to see what is going on. But verse 3 tells us that Zacchaeus was a short man. And that he couldn't see over the people. And so for him, he was a guy who got what he wanted. And so he found a place. He, he was pretty intelligent. He had some ingenuity about him where he would go and find a way to see what was going on. Find a way to see Jesus. And so think about this rich man who 
oppressed people and might have been accustomed to others to deferring to him out of fear, ran ahead and climbed up into a, a sycamore tree to see Jesus. That Zacchaeus in this moment put himself where he can physically see the Lord. In this moment, he positions himself in the path of, of hope. He, he puts himself in the path of grace. Now, whether he knew that or not, I don't know. And I don't think he knew that, right? He, he was just curious. But, but God knew all along what was going on. God, God knew how Zac- Zacchaeus would climb a tree. He, he knew how he would look. And Zacchaeus needs to see the Lord. Zacchaeus is searching for hope. And hope is Jesus. Now, now just think about that for a moment because this applies in our own life that, that you and I need to continually put ourselves in the path of hope and in the path of grace. Now, as a Christian, how do you put yourself in the path of grace? I know it's more rhetorical, but I just want to give you a second to think. You know, every time that you open up God's word, every time you read the word of God, you are putting yourself in the path of grace. God speaks through his word. The hope and grace that, that, that sends our roots deepest, that truly grows us up in Christ, who, who truly nourishes us and, and truly, truly builds us up and, and produces lasting spiritual maturity. It, it streams just from really ordinary things. We might think of something that we want to be spectacular, but you know what? Just open up our Bible on an ordinary day puts ourselves in the path of of grace and mercy. It puts us in the path of God. And God speaks. The Bible intake in your own life, when you get in the Word, you are putting yourself in the path of God's grace. When you put yourself in community with other brothers and sisters in Christ where they are speaking the Word of God, you you are putting yourself in the path of of grace and you are putting yourself in the path of, of mercy. Now Zacchaeus didn't know exactly what he was doing. We never know exactly what we're doing. But our God does. And God puts us where he needs us, and God puts us where he he wants us, in places where we see, in places where we hear, in places where he speaks. Zacchaeus put himself in that kind of place. In verses 5 through 7, we realize that God is pursuing Zacchaeus. We realize that God pursues us. Verses 5 through 7, look at that. Jesus saw Zacchaeus in the tree. And Jesus called him by name. Now, I don't know how often Zacchaeus' name, meaning pure and righteous, the meaning of his name meant something. And, and he grew up, you know, as a kid. And I don't know exactly if he thought he would always be crooked. Uh, I don't know if he always thought that he would cheat people out of what was theirs. But he definitely wasn't living his name. But Jesus, I find it interesting, is surrounded by, some people think, maybe thousands of people. He identifies Zacchaeus, and he calls him out by name. They had never met before, but the Lord knew Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus knew the Lord. And that's really the case with all of us. In in verse 5, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. It's very clear from the text that Jesus was pursuing Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus put himself in a position to see Jesus physically. And by putting himself in the position to see Jesus physically, he also puts himself in a position to see Jesus really personally and and socially. And so Zacchaeus receives Jesus' instruction and invitation. And so he comes down the tree, and verse 6 says that he does it joyfully. Really, joyfully is the only way to respond when the Son of God calls you by name. No doubt that that some of you have been hearing the Lord call you to come to Him. You've been hearing the, the Word of God. You've been thinking it through. And faith, we know, comes by hearing. It's a reminder for all of us, like Zacchaeus, if you hear the Lord and the Lord is wanting to meet with you, that you hurry to meet the Lord. 
Zacchaeus has gone from trying to see who Jesus was to hurrying to have Jesus over for dinner. He does everything that he can to know the Lord. And Christians, you and I, we must do everything we can to know the Lord. We must be diligent to know the Lord. We, we must put in practices in our own life to, to know the Lord. To put ourselves in the place of, of grace and mercy and hope before the Lord. But everyone isn't happy about this because verse 7, it says that the crowd is upset and, and they actually begin to grumble. I mean, one moment this crowd is excitedly traveling uh, along with Jesus, but now they see Jesus calling down Zacchaeus to eat with him and they all begin to grumble. They all begin to complain. They said there in verse 7, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now think about that for a moment, because the crowd seems to think that that holiness means separating from sinners and shunning them. They they seem to think that if Jesus were really a prophet or or a rabbi, then, then he should have nothing to do with the likes of Zacchaeus, who was a known sinner by everyone. And I think this is a caution for us. We need to be careful that we never assess whether someone is worthy of meeting God. Although we do this. We assess other people, other people's lives, and we, we judge them. You know, when we feel someone is unworthy of God, we, we are actually insulting that person, and we are actually insulting God. When we think someone is unworthy of God, we throw that person away long before God ever would. At the same time, we should welcome who God welcomes. We should put ourselves in a position like the crowd. We should be a a, a people who love God, who are welcoming others, who are hearing their story, who are in personal contact with what is going on. If we act like the crowd, then, then we are questioning God. We, we ought to concern ourselves with our own unworthiness if we find ourselves condemning other people. If we have a pattern of our own life of condemning others, what is our own unworthiness? Have we lost sight of our own unworthiness? It's a challenge in all of us. What's true of Zacchaeus is true of all of us. We are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, not everyone is going to be happy with your fellowship with Jesus. Even among the crowds that follow Jesus, right? There's people in your life that that are religious. But they're not happy how you're following Jesus. And and that is a point for all of us. A godly person would rejoice to see you turn from sin and follow the Lord. But not everyone in the crowd, not everyone that you are around is truly religious or truly know the Lord personally. You know, it it can be difficult to live down your sinful past when the crowds know who you were and what you did. But I think it's important, never let the crowds keep you from Jesus. Never let grumbling people interrupt the chance that you have of getting to know Jesus. That maybe there's other voices in your life that are encouraging you not to read the Word, encouraging you not to follow Jesus Christ. You have to ignore those people to fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus. In verses 8 through 10, we see how we are to repent and be saved. Can you imagine the conversation in Zacchaeus' house? Can you, can you imagine as Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house and Zacchaeus, you know, welcomes him in joyfully? Can you imagine maybe the small talk over food? Now, now Luke doesn't give us that description, but you have to think maybe what it might have been like in conversation. I mean, what was it like in conversation uh, around your dinner table over the last couple of days? What is the conversations that, that you share? And I think about it as we talk over food. So Luke doesn't tell us the conversation, but I can imagine Jesus at some point asking Zacchaeus about his life. I can imagine Jesus asking maybe even Zacchaeus about his job. I think before we we really see in this text, and before maybe Zacchaeus even knows it, he begins to pour out his life probably before Jesus. He pours out his life and his cares. 
And like the great shepherd Jesus really is, Jesus, I'm sure, spoke convicting and caring words that ministered to Zacchaeus' soul. How do we know that? Because we know of the heart change that comes about in Zacchaeus' life. Reminded of James 1.21 where it says, Therefore put away all filthiness and, and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. There are some things in Zacchaeus' life that he needed to put away. There are things that he needed, that, t- thinking through that, that just verse, putting away the filthiness, has this idea of taking it off. And truly only Jesus Christ could do that for Zacchaeus. But we see things being stripped away. God saved Zacchaeus after he put himself in a position to see and know the Lord. Zacchaeus repents of his sin, and immediately we see a, a, a change in heart. That Zacchaeus, he forsakes stinginess and greediness and turns to those he's wronged and, and, and generosity. You, you see that in, in verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Zacchaeus had an idol in his life, and it was money. One one author said that we need to dismember our idols. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus begins to do. Zacchaeus forsakes his stinginess. Zacchaeus forsakes his greediness and turns to those he wronged in generosity. And in in a world where riches choke out the word and strangle faith, to, to give to others, really, in this passage, we see signifies repentance in Zacchaeus' life. He demonstrates a, a newfound obedience to God. And Zacchaeus provides us, really, a, a great picture of repentance. And we see this, I think, in two forms. In, in verse 8, first there is justice in the form of redistribution of wealth. So, so Zacchaeus takes what he has accumulated in his life and he, and he gives half of everything he accumulated to the poor. So the first off, that's the first thing that he does. He takes half of what he had and he gives it to the poor. Th- this deed is free and voluntary, meaning that nowhere in Scripture does it say that he was supposed to do that. This is response to his conversation with Jesus. This is in response to repentance and belief in Jesus. We see the work of, God's work in Zacchaeus' life, and this is how he responds. And really, in Luke 18, if you were to read the chapter, this is kind of the opposite response of the rich man. And so, not everyone everywhere is commanded to do exactly as Zacchaeus does here, but it's really an incredible example. Some people, somewhere, sometimes, ought to do this because God does use these monies to take care of the poor. It's how God cares for the poor. And so there is redistribution of wealth that that we call giving or or charity. In fact, we're doing some of that this month. I mean, we've given the shoeboxes that went global to to kids across the world. Uh, We have done that through the Pregnancy Help Center, where uh, today you're giving, if you've given to that in some way, shape, or form, um, is a way of providing some of the essential needs that these families have with a newborn or with a baby, things that they can't provide for themselves. It's a generous way to love and care. It's something that we can do. But there's a, another kind of justice that you see here as well. It's also restitution to the victim. When, when Zacchaeus says that he will give fourfold to anyone he has defrauded, he goes really from lawbreaker to, to lawkeeper. He is seeking to do justice for those he has wronged. And I think it reminds us that that in all of our lives, repentance isn't complete until there is justice given to those that we have sinned against. That we might be right with God, but if if we haven't made it right with other people, that we are still in sin. We cannot say that we are repentant and following Christ if we intend to leave unaddressed and really unchanged the wrongs that we have committed against other people. And so it's not possible to be right vertically with God and and horizontally wrong with people. That it's both. That if we are right with God, that we will go back and pay restitution to those that we have hurt. We will go back and seek reconciliation. 
I mean, can you imagine what it, what it was like for the people of Jericho to hear a knock at their door? You know, little Johnny answers the door, and once again, hey, Dad, Zacchaeus is at the door. I can imagine the father something like, again? Zacchaeus was just here. We, we just gave him all of our money. Can you imagine the conversation as, as Zacchaeus begins with a bag of money and hands it over to Johnny's dad, and, and the guy just looking at him like, what's this? Well, it's a refund. What do you mean it's a refund? Well, I'm a changed person. I'm different. And here's a refund times four from what I've taken from you. What do you mean this is some, some kind of refund? Well, well, you know, the rabbi Jesus was over at my house. Wait a minute. The rabbi Jesus, this great teacher, this great miracle worker, was at your house? Yeah, he was. And we had a real conversation and I realize my sin. I realize my sin against you. I realize how I've wronged you, and I've come to make it right. What an incredible testimony that was going around Jericho as, as he is knocking on doors to give back four times what he had taken from those families. Jesus changes everything. It changes everything the way that Zacchaeus lives, the way that he communicates, the way that he carries himself, the way that he sees himself. He was once a guy who sought after power. He was once a guy who sought after money. And he really didn't care what other people thought. He cared about his own life. He cared about providing for himself. He cared about having everything that he really wanted. Zacchaeus meets Jesus on this road and and invites and Jesus is invited into his house and there they have a meal together there they commune and Zacchaeus has all of a sudden become now an incredible evangelist as he pays restitution to those he has wronged you know in our day in our culture we talk a lot about justice but you know the surest way to to see justice among people is to see them converted and to teach them to live as God requires them to live. In the words of Micah 6, 8, he has told you what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Zacchaeus was a guy who was living that out. You know, Zacchaeus, he also provides a marvelous picture of, of Luke 18, 27. Here, God demonstrates the possible salvation in, in a rich man's life. That God can call people from all of their idols, from a, from a lifetime of sin, from the habit of, of abusing other people, of a, abusing privilege and position and, and others, and turn such people to himself. That Jesus is coming to make them new. Zacchaeus wasn't buying his salvation. No money, no goods can buy salvation. No, he's showing by his giving the change of heart that he's had in his life. He's dismembering the idol that was in his life. His idol was money. And he is now rejecting the idol that was in control of his life by releasing it to others, by, by giving it away, by blessing others, by making restitution. When you and I are truly repentant, it affects how we view and use everything else in our life. When we repent, the idols should no longer be in control, but Jesus Christ. When we repent, we no longer look to manipulate relationships or cheat other people or lie or, or take what is not ours. We look to give. We look to bless. We look to share, just like Zacchaeus did, because he has found hope in Jesus Christ alone. That's why the Lord proclaims in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of of Abraham. We see within this passage how Zacchaeus was saved from God's judgment against sin on that very day. He was saved because he became that day a true son of Abraham. Abraham was one who believed God's promise and, and God counted Abraham as righteous because of his belief. 
That's Genesis 15, 6. And the same here has happened to Zacchaeus. He has believed the promises of Jesus. He has believed in who Jesus was and has become a son of Abraham. He has become a person of faith. As you think about conversion, conversion is the heart of Jesus' mission in the world. So the Lord says in verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. I mean, if someone ever asks you, why did Jesus come? I think this verse is the perfect answer that you and I can give. He, he came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came looking for lost people. Maybe that is you. Maybe it's you like Zacchaeus. You too realize that you have no ability to escape this lostness, this hopelessness in your own life. To say that you are a a sinner is not just to confess to some wrong behaviors, but also to admit that you have a condition. That we once had a sin condition. That sin is a condition of your nature, and because it is, you cannot escape it. You have no ability to run from yourself, just like Zacchaeus could not run from himself. That God is your only source of, for steady and unshakable and eternal hope. So we think about it, lost people are people who cannot find their way to God because of sin. They have lost their way and they are lost to God, but the Father sent His Son to find them. Not only to seek them, but also to rescue them and bring them home safely. I think it's a reminder this morning for us maybe as sinners, that Jesus is looking for you. That Jesus still seeks and saves the lost. That you and I shouldn't let the crowds keep us from Him. That we should do everything we can to to see Jesus. That we shouldn't let our pride to, to drive us deeper into lostness. Instead, receive the love of God through Jesus Christ His Son. That the Son gave His life on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins. That three days later, God raised Him from the dead for your justification. And now home, home lies in the way of the cross. Put your faith in Christ. Repent of sin and follow the Lord home. But Christians, this is also a reminder for us that we exist to make disciples from the four corners of the block to the four corners of the world. That God has placed us where we are to make real life contact with people. Just as Zacchaeus is going back to make restitution with people, he is making real life contact with people. He is in other people's lives and he is speaking the truth of the gospel as much as he understood and could know in that moment in a conversation with Jesus. And he is sharing that with other people. What a conviction for us that we must do that. That we must be constantly speaking of Jesus into each other's lives as brothers and sisters in Christ, but into the neighborhood, into the workplace, into the community that needs to hear this message. You know, the beautiful news of the Christmas season is that God wasn't willing to leave us in our lostness. He wasn't willing to leave us in our tragic and and, and desperate state that God had every right to make his final response to Zacchaeus not to be one of judgment, but he wasn't willing to do that. He chose to respond another way, not because of what he saw in us, but because of what was in him this Christmas, this season that we find ourselves in right now. We celebrate a God who is glorious in his abundant love. He chose to give grace.
pursued him? Lord, how you, through your son, preached the word to him? And Lord, it's awesome to see how he responded. Lord, how you called him out of lostness. And Lord, that he repented of his sin. And Lord, that he was changed. And Lord, thank you for the example that he leaves us in redistributing what you had given him, what he had taken from others, or that he gave it freely to others. But Lord, also that how he sought restitution and going back to make things right. Lord, thank you for the example of him speaking the word. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that finds himself in the position of Zacchaeus, just as a sinner and it's lost, Lord, I pray that they would realize that you are pursuing them, that you are calling them by name. And God, I pray that they would repent and believe the gospel. Lord, help us to never let the crowds keep us from pursuing you. God, help us in our own lives to be diligent, to put ourselves in the path of grace and hope on a daily basis, to open up your word, to read it, or to think it through. God, to live it out in obedience. Thank you for your grace. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand together and sing this song.
Amen. Our benediction comes from Jude, verse 24 and 25. And it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You are dismissed.